Go ahead and turn in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29. This is one of the hardest verses when you're studying to figure out exactly what it is that Paul is talking about. If you're not working through context, with context, you'll read it and think, where in the world did that come from and what in the world can that mean? Why is it that Paul brought that up here in the middle of chapter 15 and what are the implications of exactly what it is that he's saying to each one of us? Let's go ahead and go to our next slide there. As you look at this idea of what does it mean to be baptized to save dead people, and as you look at it, that's what that verse looks like. Uh, you know, what are they baptized for the dead for? Now, a lot of people have come up with ideas. Uh, I've run across several commentaries over the past week or two as I was studying this that say there are 30, over 30 interpretations of what this verse means. Now, I haven't found anybody who listed out what all 30 are, but... A lot of people have a lot of different ideas and a lot of different beliefs about what this verse could mean. Augustine, who was a church father, a church person in about the 3rd or 4th century, after the birth and death of Jesus, he said, well, this baptism for the dead is talking about spiritual death. And he would go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, which talked about how we once were dead in our sins, but now we have been made alive in Christ Jesus. And that's a great interpretation as long as you don't study the context. As long as you're not reading it where it's at in 1 Corinthians 15, great interpretation. John Calvin, who is another uh, church historian theologian, he said, well, what Paul's talking about here is if somebody finds out that they have a terminal illness and they're about to die, then it's a good idea for them to be baptized. So they're being baptized because they see that they're on the verge of death. Well, once again, decent interpretation, but it has nothing in the world to do with the context. And so what we want to do today is we want to study this passage, and as we study the passage, figure out what Paul is saying, and how we'll find it out is by reading the area around 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, one of the more modern interpretations and one of the more constant interpretations that came out first in the 6th century and it became very prominent in the 19th century with a religious group which originated in the Americas was this idea that you could be baptized in order to save somebody who had lived before. And so if you had come to the gospel and understood the gospel and obeyed the gospel but you said, what about my parents and what about my grandparents and what about my neighbor? People would have this idea, they'd run to this verse and say, well, you can be baptized for dead people. And so you could be baptized for your parents if they passed on, or for your grandparents, whoever it may be, whether they be in purgatory, or whether they be in hell, or whatever your idea might be for that. And so it became a very prominent thing. And if you are old enough, you remember back in 1991 where uh, many Jews ended up suing a certain church because... This church had taught that you could be baptized for the dead and they'd gone through all the Holocaust roles and they'd been baptized, they'd baptized somebody, or hopefully somebody's, otherwise that guy got really wet, 16 million times in order to save everybody who died in the Holocaust. And many of the genealogy things which are out today are out because of this idea of being baptized for the dead and looking to be baptized for your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents or somebody you knew. And so a lot of strange things come out of this verse and a lot of strange doctrines have popped up from it. Well, first of all, let's talk about what this verse doesn't say. And it doesn't say that you can be baptized for someone else. We know that for certainty. Why? Well, let's study through our Bibles. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The father is not guilty of the sins of the son, nor is the son guilty for the sins of the father. But each one of us shall take upon ourselves the consequences of our own action. Well, obviously that negates that interpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It is appointed to man once to die, 
and then the judgment. And what that shows us is there's not a change in our spiritual nature between our time of death and a time in which God shall judge the living and the dead. Looking here at Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 1 through 13, you see where Jesus gives a parable. And he calls these people in the parable virgins or bridesmaids. Five come prepared, five come unprepared. They don't have enough oil in their lamp. And so as they're waiting, the bridegroom takes a little bit longer to come than they expected. And those who weren't prepared ran out of oil in their lamps. And so when the bridegroom came, they said to everybody, give us oil. Give us material so we can be ready. And what the passage tells us there in Matthew 25 is those who are ready are not able to help those who aren't ready. In other words, what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 25, no one can be saved for you. No one can be saved on your behalf. So I've said before, put it this way, God doesn't have grandchildren. You ever think about that? God does not have grandchildren. God has children, but not grandchildren. I'm not saved because of the faith of my parents. I'm not saved because of the faith of my friends. I'm not saved because of the faith of my preacher or pastor or reverend or father or any other person. Your relationship with God depends upon you. And so Matthew 25 shows us that. In Luke chapter 16, looking here at verses 19 through 31, we see the rich man and Lazarus. And of course, one fared sumptuously. And one just sat with the dogs and had nothing to eat. They both died. And the poor man, Lazarus, wakened with Abraham, wakened in paradise. The rich man who had lived his entire life just wasting everything, wasting time, wasting money, wasting everything, ends up in torment. And so he cries out to Abraham and he says, send Lazarus to bring me some water. Send Lazarus to go help me. Or send Lazarus to go speak to my brothers so they don't end up here. And as you read that passage, what you'll see Abraham and God say is there's a gulf. No one now can come to where you are to change your condition. No one now can come to your place and make things better. The decision you make, the fate in which you place yourself, those choices are made during life. Now is a day of salvation, is what we'd see there. Of course, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, we are told that as we teach people, we are to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And so what you see there is the responsibility when a person obeys the gospel, not only are they baptized, but they must be taught. In Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. Baptism alone does not save if it's not with belief. And so you can't, be, you can't believe for somebody else. You can't, Acts 2, 38, repent for somebody else. And therefore, you cannot be baptized for someone else. And so as you and I read these passages, we read the importance of, in our life, making sure that we're right with God, making sure that we live the way that He would want us to live and do the things that He would want us to do. And that passage there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, Each one of us will receive in this life the results or the works for the life in which we have done according to the judgment which we have done. So, that's not what it means, being baptized for another person. So the question is, what does it mean? Let's look at the context of 1 Corinthians 15. And as we break apart 1 Corinthians 15, what Paul is talking about here is the resurrection. And here, and in a little bit of Matthew 25, and a little bit of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is where we have the clearest picture of what the resurrection is about, and what the resurrection is for and how we should live in light of the resurrection. Verse 1 through 4, we see that the gospel contains the fact of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every gospel sermon needs to have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and what our response is to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so with that verse 1 through 4, 
we'll look here in a few minutes, Romans 6, 3 and 4, about how Christ died, we also died of sin. How Christ was buried, we also are buried in the waters of baptism. And how Christ returned from the grave, so also you and I walk in newness of life, living as a New Testament Christian. But Paul goes on from there and he says, I want you to know that even though people may say they don't believe in a resurrection, there's over 500 witnesses. 500 witnesses in Galilee, the people that you know, James and Peter and John. And he says, even I who was born in undue time, even I am a... Res an, am a uh, the second, reset it. <laughs> Unplug it, plug it back in. I have seen Jesus Christ. I am an eyewitness who has been there. And so, and then he goes on, 1219, he says, if there is no resurrection, we are of all people to be most pitied. We have no hope. Why be a Christian if there's no resurrection? Now, sometimes I hear preachers say, well, even if God didn't exist, it's still better to live as a Christian because that's the best way of life. Those people have not suffered enough as a Christian because Christianity brings on suffering. And Paul says, why would you suffer for something that does not exist? Why would you suffer for something of which you have no hope? And then he says in verse 20 through 28, Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. We are coming after. Our bodies, even though we don't understand the full aspect of the resurrection, our bodies in 1 John 3, 2 are going to look just like the body of Jesus. We are going to have a body just like his body. There will be a physical resurrection and we will be with one another. Now a passage we'll look at more closely here in a second. The context of what we're doing, 29 through 34, this knowledge of the resurrection changes you. When you really understand the power of the resurrection, when you truly believe that God shall raise us from the dead, it will change who you are and it will change how you act. And then, of course, he begins speaking about our bodies, how you don't know what a kernel of corn will look like until it falls and it's planted and it'll grow. So also our bodies will be that way. God will take away this mortal and give an immortal. God will take away this corruptible body that's falling apart and give us a body that shall never fall apart. Therefore, the ultimate victory, death has been done away with. Sin has been done away with. Verse 58, therefore, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that you may be found whole in Him. All right, so we got through all that. That's the introduction of the lesson. Don't worry, the, the part of the lesson is really short compared to the introduction. Let's go to our next slide here. And as we go to our next slide, here's the question. What is it that Paul is telling us is the purpose of this baptism for the dead? What is it that he's trying to get across to us that's happening right here? Well, first of all, he says, if you look at the full Bible context... One of the ways in which you can interpret this verse, which is a very reasonable way of interpreting this verse, is it's logical to be baptized so that you can be with people who have passed from this earth. If you've been a Christian long, you've lost some people who are close to you. Maybe parents, maybe grandparents, maybe people who brought you to Christ. And you and I can look across the ages and we see people who have gone on and met the Lord. And there's reason for us want to want to be with them once again. Now, to show us in the context that that's what Paul is talking about, turn in your Bibles or electronic devices a little bit earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look there in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 18, he says, If there is no resurrection... Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus have likewise perished. And so one of the arguments for the resurrection, Paul is saying, is not only you want the resurrection to exist so that you can rise, but we are baptized, we are looking forward to the resurrection to be with people whom we love. Now, this is a side note, chasing rabbits here. But it's something important for us to acknowledge and to think about as Christians. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to obey the gospel. 
because not because I don't believe it. I understand it, and I know the need to obey. But sometimes we say, I don't want to obey the gospel because what would that say about my parents who didn't obey the gospel? Or what would that say about my friends who are not Christians? Am I condemning them to hell by obeying what the Bible teaches? And sometimes we in our minds think, well, I don't want to accuse somebody or I don't want to say that somebody's going to be lost by obeying the gospel. Well, no matter, we see in the passage earlier, we looked at in Luke 16, if someone is in torment, they are praying with all of their heart that you will obey the gospel and not be with them. Secondly, and maybe this is most important, you and I, we're not God. And I cannot read another person's heart. I cannot tell you someone is saved, someone is lost, because that is God's job. Now, what is my job? What is your job? Is to teach the gospel, to study our Bibles, to show what the truth of the gospel is. And so regardless of what the fate is of those who have gone on before, they would want us to obey. And so in many ways we can say, well, this passage is teaching us that we should be baptized so we can be with those who've gone on before. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23 you remember where David lost his infant son? And he had mourned and he had prayed and he had fasted for those weeks upon weeks in which this child was sick. But once the child died, David got up, cleaned himself, and went about daily work. And everybody told David, you, you've done it wrong. You're supposed to grieve after the death, not before the death. David, you, you're mixed up here. What's David say? David said, there's nothing I can do. But I'm going to live so I can be with my boy. Because he can't come back to me, but I shall go and be with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning of verse 13, says, I don't want you to be ignorant, my brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him all those who have died in Christ Jesus. Imagine how wonderful that reunion's going to be. Imagine how glorious it will be when we are with all the saints of all the ages and we could spend time talking together. Noah, why did you put those mosquitoes on that boat? Peter, why did you always speak up the way you spoke up? And there may be many other questions we have, and that's fine because we have all of eternity don't we second thing that perhaps this passage is telling us let's look at it from a paragraph context okay read with me beginning in chapter 15 and 29 chapter 15 29 otherwise what would they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all why are they baptized for the dead all right let's keep reading and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus the Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with the beasts of Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Do not be deceived. Evil, comp evil companionship corrupts good morals. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of the Lord. And I speak this to your shame. All right. Check out, that, check out that paragraph there, okay? He says, we're baptized for the dead. Now, why? Look at the reasons here. He says, I, I've been baptized for the dead because I live in jeopardy of death every hour. I'm with these beasts at Ephesus. I've been imprisoned. And we could go through the list of 2 Corinthians of all the things Paul says he's gone through. He says... If the dead do not rise, then let's be like the Epicureans. Let's eat, drink, tomorrow we die. If there's nothing left, you need to experience everything in life in the days that you have. If there's no reason, no reason to think of the resurrection, it doesn't matter who your friends are. 1533 says, watch out about having bad friends. If there's no resurrection, hang out with anybody you want. And if there's no resurrection, finally, looking there at verse 34, then there's no reason for us to live righteously. So what is it Paul's telling us here? 
Paul's telling us baptism frees you from the fear of death. You see, those who don't believe in God, they're in a tough spot. Because they may have another day, or they may have a few decades. But the time's coming when it's all over. The time's coming when there's no hope. The time is coming when there is no other reason to be there. But you and I, who are Christians, live in a different context. We've been baptized against the fear of death. Notice how Scripture describes baptism. Galatians 3.27, we are clothed in Christ. Acts 2.38, through repentance and baptism, we receive remission or forgiveness of sins. Acts 22, verse 16, our sins are washed away at baptism. 1 Peter 3.21, through baptism, we are saved. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The third thing we could look at, we are baptized because... We will die. We're baptized because we will die. Now, don't let me get too technical. We're going to look at a Greek preposition. And I know people go, oh, no. Just eating turkey, and now we're talking Greek. This is not good. But we'll go through it real quick. There's two words for four. So it's four words, but we're not going to go that deep. Two words for the word four in the Bible, okay? The first word is ice, E-I-S. All right, and you're aware of ice because preachers talk about ice pretty often. EIS. Uh, passages where that's shown, Acts 2:38. Repent and be baptized for ice remission of sins. Okay, what's that mean? Unto remission of sins, or in order to receive remission of sins. Okay? Another passage where ice is found would be, let me think of my mind right here. Okay, Matthew 26 and 28. This is my body, which was shed, ice, remission of sins, for the remission of sins, okay? We are baptized in order to be saved, in order to receive remission of sins. Christ in Matthew 26 was put to death in order for us to be saved, all right? So you see that connection there. That word here, looking at the very beginning, what would they do who are baptized for the dead, it's not ice, it's hooper, okay? H-U-P-E-R. Now, why is that important? It means on behalf of. It means in order, uh, because of, okay? Uh, some verses. The good shepherd, he lays down his life, hooper, for the sheep, John 10, 11. While we were helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's a hooper. In order to, or for behalf, in behalf of. That's Romans 5, 6. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 also contains it. And so the reason I bring that out in this prepositional context, we are baptized because we know we will die. We are baptized because we see that one day we'll stand in judgment. In other words, you and I are going through life, and the younger you are right now, the more immortal you feel. If you are below 20 or below 30 or maybe below 40, Death, you know, that, that's something that happens to everybody else. Now, you start getting a little older, and you start realizing, okay, maybe, maybe it's possible I could die. Every one of us knows the day of death will come. And the reason why you need to be baptized is because you need to get ready to meet God before God comes. You need to obey the gospel before it's too late. And so what he's saying here, if you look at it from the preposition that's there, we are baptized because we know that we will die. We are baptized because we know the moment is coming where we shall meet God, and you sure don't want to be ready or not ready when you're standing before God. How did Peter put it? Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, after just telling people to be baptized, he says, save yourself from this corrupt generation. The promise is for you, your children, and all those who are far off. Be saved. We need to be ready to meet the Lord. Now, current context. What does this verse mean for us today? The verse means that you should be baptized. If you've reached the age of accountability, 
If you have reached the time in which you recognize sin and you've studied the gospel, the, the scriptures enough to recognize that you have sin in your life, there's one thing you need to do. Now, of course, every one of us is busy. Of course, every one of us is worried about what everybody else thinks about us. Of course, there are so many things happening in life. But Paul is saying right here, there's one thing that matters. One thing that truly matters, and that is that you be right with God. You be right with the Lord. And the passage we looked at just a few minutes ago, Romans 6, 3 and 4, tells us that our baptism is an imitation of the gospel. God, Jesus died, was buried, and was raised never to die again. You and I are called to die to our sins, to repent and to change our lives, giving ourselves fully unto Him. You and I are called to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And you and I are called to live holy for Him each and every day. So the question is, what will you do? Will you be baptized for the dead? Will you be baptized seeing all these things of why you should live 